ICQ Podcast Episode 291 The S Meter. Well, hi, fellow Amatan Radio enthusiasts, and welcome to this, our 291st episode of the ICQ Amatan Radio podcast, supported by William Henkelman, uh, Kilo Charlie 3, Hotel Zulu Uniform, and Kevin Rump, uh, Whiskey November 7 Zulu, along with our monthly and annual subscription donors. In this episode, Martin MRNRB is joined by Chris, Mike Zero, Tango Charlie Hotel, Martin, Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lima, Dan, Kilo Bravo 6, November Uniform, and Frank, Kilo 4, Foxtrot Mike Hotel, to discuss latest Amatan Radio news. Myself, Colin, M6BOY, rounds up the news in brief, and this episode's feature is a feature on the S-Meter. Well, as always, it's your donations that keep us advert-free, and as I say, um, shows your value in the show, and stops us taking, obviously, commercials on things like uh, your website, uh, domain hosts, and mattresses, and gunners, what else that people take adverts for. So this episode, along with those monthly and subscription donors we already have, um, Kevin uh, Rump, uh, Whiskey November 7 Zulu, um, sent us a note saying to uh, Colin Martin and all, uh, podcast is great, thanks for doing it. And uh, he's from the northern suburbs of Seattle. So Kevin, thanks a lot for uh, for helping us out. And along with uh, William uh, Heckelman, uh, Kilo Charlie 3, Hotel Zulu Uniform, we really do appreciate you keeping this episode advert free. You can do uh, your bit and show your support for the show and your value for the show by visiting www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate. And as I say, there's a selection of different options there where you can show your support for the show. There's uh, about a month now to go uh, for our uh, ICQ podcast event, the Work AWRL CEO Howard Mickle uh, event. This is um, getting Mike, uh, sorry, Howard on the air on uh, 20 meters and 14.24 megahertz uh, on the 13th of May, 2 p.m. Eastern or 1800 UTC. Uh, people who successfully operate uh, Howard uh, will uh, receive a special QSL card uh, from the AWRL for this event sponsored by the ICQ podcast. So certainly book that one in your diary and uh, make contact with Howard. Well, now we join Martin, Chris, Martin, Dan and Frank to discuss the latest Amatan radio news, including will the FCC allow an all-digital AM band and grid and prefix award programs announced. I hope you enjoy. Well, hi guys. Welcome to episode 291 of the ICQ podcast, tonight's roundtable. I'm joined by Mr. Chris Howard, M0TCH. Hi, Chris. Hi, Martin. Episode 291. How on earth did that happen? I don't My know. Word. The frightening one is I've worked out how old I'm going to be if we make do 400, and even how much older I'm going to be when we get to 500. Assuming we get there, that is, Chris. We'll get, I'm sure we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, 95. Not, uh, not far off, Martin. Not far off. Uh, that was Mr. Martin Roffo, M0SGL, and... Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um, my my table's not round. My table's kind of L-shaped. So I just want to say this for the record. Yeah, but you're just awkward. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I like to be awkward. I know. You like to get me in all sorts of trouble, don't you? I do my best. That's why Chris is here. Yeah, I know. And I behave myself at your wedding. <laughs> for, for once? For once, yeah. No, it was once? a good day. I did behave yeah. myself. Um, I didn't. <laughs> you didn't, yeah, I know. No. <laughs> I was okay. a little bit drunk. You realise Emma might listen to this, so you'd be able to... Boys, behave, please. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there he is. Okay. Please wrap it up, Martin. Come on. Yeah. Um, sorry, before we go on all night winding Martin up, uh, the other side of the pond, we have Mr. Dan Romacek, KB6NU, who wasn't with us the last time we recorded, but great to have you back with us, Dan. And I'm certainly glad to be back. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we haven't grown up, you know that, but hey, that's life. Probably got more expensive, though. Yeah, certainly have. And also from the other side of the pond, uh, we have Mr. Frank Howell, K4FMH, who did a great uh, great interview with the AWRL CEO, didn't you, Frank? Well, thank you. Uh, it, having a good guest makes a big difference. And, well, and good to be back, guys. Uh, it's great to have you. Right, let's start uh, our news stories this week. And a lot of them are from the state side, but I still believe that they're good news stories and, um, you know, hopefully something else will come out of it in other parts of the world. 
First news story is not really amateur radio, but it is radio and it is interesting. The FCC have been asked to allow all digital on the AM broadcast bands. That's uh, down in the medium wave. And, you know, I'm thinking giving the AM bands a little bit more of a sparkle and and almost a a regeneration could be quite good. Uh, Dan, do you want to go first on this one? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, I I think anything that can make uh, AM radio more competitive would be a good thing. Uh, we talked a little bit previously about uh, someone who just had to purchase an FM radio station to keep his AM radio station alive, and that just doesn't sound good. No, no, no. That, that does sound pretty rough, doesn't it? Mr. Ruffell, you actually do a bit of broadcasting, uh, not... And you do go out on media wave, don't you? Goes out. Do you know what? It goes out on FM, medium wave, DAV, um, satellite, and on Freeview as well. So yeah, we go out all over the place. So this, this, we say all digital. Is this is all digital like a codec, like we have DAB in the UK? Am I right in thinking that? Well, it's called MA3, All Digital Mode of HD Radio, which is a right. mouthful, Martin. Uh, so I'm assuming that there's certainly a codec there for, for the digital. Okay. And what is digital radio like in the USA? I mean, we hear of HD radio, you know, DAB radio. In the, in the, in the, certainly in the UK, we, we know it's, it's not the success it's being made out to be. What is digital like? What is the digital take up like in America? Well, on the broadcast end, I'm I'm less knowledgeable. Dan Dan may know that I, I'm a Sirius XM radio, which is satellite right. HD radio, yeah. in both in automobiles and I here in my office uh, where we're where I'm recording. Uh, you know, I have one, and I bought a, a so-called permanent license. You know, for that and. Right. You got all these channels like cable TV, except they're they're just audio. Dan, are you are you more aware than I about uh, digital broadcast radio? It's, to be honest, I don't think, aside from maybe a few experimental installations, we have any digital broadcast okay. here. I'm not wonder, aware of any. My, my experience of um, in the states of digital, like you said, Danny. Sorry, um, Frank is is the satellite Sirius XM system. So the rental car I had. Uh, over the new year, we, we drove over to Tennessee from um, from Washington, and that was a long drive. And of course, um, being America, being such a large country, I, I guess having having a network of of uh, transmitters to cover the whole country is quite difficult. Mm. So satellite, I think, is probably the right the right solution for a country like the yeah. States, um, it being such a large such a large place. I mean, the well, one thing that, about that okay. is that it is like any other satellite. You go into a tunnel, you get into yeah, a yeah, you know, a wooded area, you, you can drop out. We had the odd uh, drop out here and there, but it wasn't too bad. Yeah, I mean, the only reason I asked what what digital radio is 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 like in America, what the take up is, is to whether or not there is any point in putting digital in the medium wave band in the UK. Is there any point in putting trying to put digital in in other spaces? Well, no, because digital has kind of flopped really in, in favour of Alexa, Google Home products like that. And you know, people are not listening. We know to medium wave as much because the quality on medium wave compared to a stereo FM signal is it's not great. It's it's great for speech radio if you just listen to talk. If you listen to radio forward, they're doing football commentary or not uh, cricket commentary or whatever. Then it's great. You put music on, it doesn't sound sound as good. But when you start talking about putting you know stereo AM in or digital into the medium wave band. It's breathing life into the into the into the radio. It's more spaces to get broadcasters on the air. Particularly, I know in certain in crowded areas, that's probably a great thing. You compare that to what we do in the UK. In the UK, what will we do? We turn the bit rate down on the codec. We'd go out a, a, a much lower bit rate. The quality on the audio would be, would be worse on DAB, and there's your extra station. But we've got this. You know, in the UK, we've got you know, a, a media wave band that is particularly empty. And you know, if it's if it's similar in the UK, in in the USA, then why not you know, breathe some more life back into the medium wave band? Somewhere else for a station to get on the air. If people have the technology to receive it, why not? Well, yeah, but you mentioned you mentioned um, doing uh, internet radio and things like that, yep. the Google Hubs and that. But in fairness, 
let's face it, we are a particularly small country. We have a yes. lot of people yes. in a small area. We've got a massive infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Large countries like the States, Russia, or Australia, you know, they don't have the the infrastructure, and, and it's not knocking those countries. There's no it would cost in, more, wouldn't it? I, yeah, it just costs too much to put the infrastructure in. Therefore, using things like medium wave could be a very, very cost-effective way of doing it. If you've got the space for the towers and the technology and stuff, then yeah, why not? Yeah, well, if you've got a big country and lots of area, yeah. you've got. When well, we talk about you know things going, a lot of stations certainly in the UK going to IP delivery, and you're getting them through your phone and things like that. But yeah, if you, I, I guess, cell phones in America, you know, I guess out in the sticks, you don't, you don't get it. So that's where your your medium wave would come into its own, I suppose. So, I do find it well, quite what? ironic that we're talking we're talking about the AM bands, but of course this isn't AM, is it? This, this is a the medium wave, you know. It, well, yes, the public don't even send me to AM. F AM and FM is just a, a different sounding radio, isn't it, to them? Isn't it? Yeah. They, I don't suppose they really understand what it means. Obviously, as, as amateurs, we understand that AM is a FM, a different types of modulation. But, of course, this is um, not AM, is it? This just happens to use the same band as they normally use for AM, AM, AM um, so signals. Is the, is the codec modulating the amplitude of the band? I guess I haven't thought about that. You know, how does, I, I, how does, I'm, how does the I'm AB guessing it's not, it? but I don't know. Using <laughs> FM, I suppose it doesn't, does it? Frank I'd and, like to see what it does on, an oscill on, a, on, a, on a oscilloscope. Yeah. Frank and Dan, we've um, sort of pulled your uh, radio network apart a little bit. Uh, not not nasty. <laughs> we've pulled the entire American story back to the UK. <laughs> but, 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 we're, but it's good to hear, though, from some of the experiences in the UK, though, uh, you know, on, on this now, this proposal is an opt-in. It's as it's proposed rulemaking by the FCC to allow commercial AM stations to opt-in to a new mode of broadcasting, ostensibly on their same frequencies. But you know, as we talked uh, prior to recording, you know, it muddies the waters on the band allocation and some things like that. We don't know what the propagation scenario would be. I would add this to the discussion about large country U.S. What has happened with broadband internet here is that it's the metropolitan centers that have gotten broadband, and the rural areas have just not gotten the penetration. There's a big movement right now in pushing uh, what us hams uh, kind of roundly criticize because of RFI, broadband over power lines. And I know in my state, Mississippi, just passed a law to facilitate that in the utility management arena. And here's where I'm going. Where you've got an intense capital or, or capital intensity requirement to make a shift like this, where is that going to happen? It's where you've got a market. And you're going to have a market more in metropolitan areas. And you will have less of a market out in rural areas. And yet if that infrastructure has to be there, for them to effectively receive that. And remember, everybody's got to buy a new, new radio, a new receiver. So not to kind of stick my finger in the eye, but it, you know, it, it would be great if it enhances the quality of what's broadcast. On the other hand, I just lay out what are some things I, I think might be challenges. Mm, I, I wonder when you talk about enhancing the quality, whether they need to be talking to the likes of Omnia um optimod and things like that and then, and then you know people need to up the processing on their radio stations on on am or medium wave thus increasing the quality rather than going down the the digital line certainly if people have to buy different equipment to receive it because let, let's face it don't make your listener do work they don't want to spend money they don't want to do work you know maybe over time as better things come out maybe they'll make the switch but people aren't going to spend money for you know, for the, like, okay, I'll go and listen to another station or I'll listen to it online or, hey, I'll listen to a CD or whatever. Yeah. When you look at the age distribution, uh, uh, the research is out there, younger groups of people are not big AM listeners today, regardless. Right. Older people tend to listen to the content, talk radio, religious programming, uh, and and, and uh, their talk show host and things like that. Anyway, just a few thoughts here. This is interesting. There's one guy in Texas who has a number of stations and translators 
and he's pushed the FCC to take a look at it, and hopefully they will. Yeah. Well, I think, it, I think it's just showing innovation and something we should look at. If it regenerates AM over the next, uh, the AM bands, the medium wave AM uh, broadcast bands, then so be it. You know, yeah. it can't be a bad thing. It, and it's a great story on the cusp of the National Association of Broadcasters Conference. Yeah, yeah. Moving to our next news story, the Raspberry Pi magazine, Magpi, M-A-G-P-I, uh, features ham radio. Now, this is a uh, magazine that can be downloaded off the internet. You can pay for it and have a hard copy, or you can download a PDF file straight from the internet. Uh, it features a number of amateur radio uh, projects that uh, you can do with Raspberry Pi. And I actually, being a Raspberry Pi owner for some time, you know, I've had G predict the satellite prediction program running on a Raspberry Pi many a times, but it's not just that. There's add on boards and bits and pieces. So, uh, Chris, do you want to go first on this one? Yeah, I can do. So, the Magpie is, I think, a great uh, magazine. It's been going for, for quite a while. It's, it's free. It, I'm interested. It's the first magazine that gave away a computer on it on, as part of its uh, cover on, you know, stuck on the front uh, some time ago from Martin. And they brought out the Pi Zero. You actually got a free computer with your magazine, which is amazing. But yes, they've got quite a nice section, quite a few pages on amateur radio. It talks about the background, a little bit of, um, you know, it might get a few folks. I think there's parallels between people that are interested in, in, in this sort of thing and radio. So you might get a few folks um, into a hobby, which is great. And, it, and it's got some projects in there which people can look at, which I think are good. I mean, for me, the Raspberry Pi and the amateur radio go together quite well. I, th- I think the Raspberry Pi is quite, uh, and for those that aren't familiar with it, it's a little computer the size of a credit card that uh, you can power from a, a USB charger and it's got connections on there for a network and it's got USB connections and an and HDMI output to plug into a, into a TV. So it's a very small, very cheap computer. Um, they've got various different versions now. The, the normal version, I think, is about £30 UK uh, or equivalent in your local currency. Um, but what it's really good for, it's, very, very, it's not particularly, particularly powerful or it's not too bad. But what it's good for is it's very low power consumption. So if you want something to run all the time, like, say, a, a D-Star hotspot, for example, you can you can use this to run your D-Star hotspot and just leave it going and not worry about having to have a computer running all the time using up too much uh, electrical power. So I think it's uh, it's a very useful um, little device. And I think, I think this is a great – this magazine feature is a great way to uh, perhaps get some more folks and tell me and have some ideas as to what it can be useful. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Dan, I know you blogged about this. Um, you got uh, any more to say on this one? Yeah, so one of the projects um, is this little whisper transmitter. And one of the guys here in our club actually built this. And uh, we it's one of the projects we show at our when we go to a maker fest. And uh, it always gets... Uh, you know some interesting comments and uh he he did the um in fact i i uh worked with him a little bit on making the low pass filter uh so what pi does is it wiggles one of the gpo lines at about 10 megahertz and uh you can hook you hook up a little dipole antenna to it and you're transmitting on 30 meters you know, whisper on 30 meters and uh, i help him build a little uh a uh, low pass filter for it but uh yeah all these things are kind of cool kind of little cool things and gets the gets makers uh interested in ham radio and uh that's why we go to these maker fairs so yeah it's all it's all cool certainly is now frank you and i are linux type people i know the guys get the cross out in a minute and want to exercise us exorcism and that sort of thing but uh what do you think about the raspberry pi and amateur radio well i I think it's, uh, in a broad sense, Martin, getting amateur radio operators who aren't homebrew builders, that is, they design a circuit, put, design a, a, a printed circuit board and, and that kind of thing, getting them into making, building, following what someone else has done, and then they get the bug and they design something themselves is a good thing. And the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino are both vehicles, and especially the Raspberry Pi, since it's uh, its own self-standing computer, where the Arduino is a more limited version of an instruction set. Getting people into building things like, as as Dan talked about, the Whisper 
uh, beacon and that sort of thing is great. Now, how do you get people to do that? One of the ways is you have a nice, slick, did I say free, magazine that shows them all the cool things they can do. And these are all the cool kids are doing this. And that's part of how you lead that horse to water. So I'm, I'm very positive about this. I think it's great. Yeah, I agree with you, Frank. Martin, have you played with a Raspberry Pi or uh, are you a bit too have. busy? You know, I was just, I was just reading an interesting uh, blog about it, kb6nu.com. But uh, yeah, I have, and I've got one in my hand. I've used it for one thing, which is a D Star access point um, because it's low power, runs on a USB charger, and it just works. You plug it in, it just works. I've got a DVAP dongle on the top, switch it on, it boots, loads the software, does the job. I really like it. I do have another one. Um, I've got a slightly more up to date Raspberry Pi uh, somewhere that I, I play with from time to time. I've yet to decide what I'm going to do with that, but. Uh, it will, you know, it gets it gets played. I have a lot of fun with it, and yeah, we know there's loads of things you can do with it. From the like, you know, you can set up wisp beacons, you can turn it into a transmitter itself. Although quite how clean that is, I don't know. I've seen all sorts of you know innovation and think, well, really, they are the, you know, they're the BBC Micro that you know, likes of myself and probably Chris grew up with. Um, but for the modern age, and yeah, you can you can press them into use for amateur radio use. The one thing I would like to enable on it though is the YSX software for Yesu Fusion because then I would could just run it on a Raspberry Pi and not run it on a um on a Dell desktop computer which it currently runs on obviously using a bit more power. You your ticket number one million and one who wants that <laughs> last thing, Martin. because uh, yeah. I'm 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 in there about one million uh, there with <laughs> you. I'm I'm told by the US Yesu rep John Crook that that won't happen. One of the reasons is is it was programmed in my, partly Microsoft Basic and with .NET, and that even with Mono and those kind of things, it it's just not something they're going to do. And I'm as disappointed. You know as I, there is a pardon? solution for this. Okay, reprogram it in a, in something that works on a Pi. If you there, go back to the drawing board, you are absolutely you are <laughs> absolutely correct. And until well, we get your repeaters, here we go. And say we get into this problem of open source, closed source, and telling us the instruction set. Now, the problem with it is there are some other instruction sets that do work, something like OpenSpot and some others, but they don't do all the little fancy and ever-changing features that Yesu puts in it. So I'm with you. I'm, I'm sure, but I mean, you, be, you bear in mind that you can run D-Star stuff on it. Yeah. It'll only be a matter of time. The other thing, you know, I think of, well, at, you know, the the other obvious thing, well, if you if you put it, or put the software, write the software for a Raspberry Pi, you, the Raspberry Pi will fit inside the repeater box, and you just have yeah. an Ethernet connection on the back. And I'm, I mean, just saying, if anyone from the AC is listening, that's all and, I, the only little little seed I'm going to plant. Well, the the DVAP dongle that that you showed here, quite off, not in re, the audio recording, of course, is, is uh, designed partly uh, by one of my Elmers, Robin Cutshaw in Atlanta, and you know that's part of the thing about the D Star standard is open. Yeah. The realization of the codec in a chip instruction set that's then produced by TI or somebody. Yeah, that's what's proprietary, and so other people can create that standard, mm. and it's just unfortunately not the same for uh, the Yesu uh, stuff, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Well, let's hope. Uh, let's hope they're listening. Let's say they're usually open for 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 some suggestions, <laughs> so uh, that could go down very well. Moving on. Well, Dennis right. Machenbacher wrote a very, very good book on filters about 30 years ago. So I know Dennis understands the issue. So, Dennis, if you're listening, like uh, the Star Wars character, you're our only hope. Yeah. May, may the force be with him. <laughs> the force be with him. Use the fork. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Moving on. Uh, um, the next two news stories are effectively the same story, but. Uh, there's a new digital mode that suddenly uh, sprung up, and uh, predominantly it's on 70 SEMs. It's a new packet radio mode, and it's got a fairly high uh, data throughput. So, interesting. I think it's an interesting one. Chris, do you want to go first on this one? 
Can do, yeah. So th- this is interesting. So 500 kilobits per second is pretty quick. I'm pretty sure that the D Star's got a mode called high speed data or digital data mode, and I think that's 128 kilobits per second. So this is this is quite fast compared to that. Uh, it runs on on 77s, I believe, and therefore it's probably using a fair bit of bandwidth. I'm not sure what the or if I'm what is, it's not in this, the article here, but uh, I think it's probably quite a bit to be able to carry that amount of uh, data. But um, yeah, it's packet radio, so it allows you to carry IP traffic between computers. So I can see it. Uh, I mean, it talks about the benefits of uh, having better coverage than the Wi-Fi bands over terrain, which you, which you would have at that sort of frequency. So I can see this is this being quite uh, qu- quite quite useful for for, for lots of uh, applications. It's not a rival to FT8 or anything like that. This is not a dig- this is not a, an HF low signal type mode. This is about getting data, you know, lots of data through quite quickly. So uh, it looks quite quite interesting. It talks about using a particular chip. So I think it might have a, a dependency on a particular piece of hardware for it to work. So I don't think it's going to be based on some software you can download, but uh, it could be a useful um, tool in our in our in our toolbox. Very much so, very much so, and certainly for the emergency services like UK's Raynet um, uh, Aries and Races in the States and uh, other emergency groups around the world. But, Dan, you uh, blogged about this, and then somebody came back to you about symbol rates, didn't they? Right, so apparently the uh, the maximum symbol rates for this mode are, uh, are above the uh, U.S. regulations. So I don't, you know, I don't know if it can be dialed back a little bit for use here in the U.S. But uh, yeah, apparently the the maximum rates are above what we're allowed here in the states. But all in all, it sounds quite an interesting mode. Um, Frank, you got thoughts on this one? You coined the data modes, aren't you? Uh, some uh, here's how I put it in context. You know, we we've had the broadband ham net mesh technology Arden. You know, there have been some squabbles over what you call it, but in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands, some of which overlap with ISM and and, um, what is our normal Wi-Fi channels, as it's channelized, that's kind of blossomed, but there's been some problems in getting what's commonly called a mother node. When you're out in California and you have these mountains, You've got these mountaintops, and, and, and they produce just wonderful networks in Puget Sound in the state of Washington, uh, around uh, San Jose, and they got these mountains. When you get outside of that, you have to get space on a tower, and that tends to cost, and there's competition and so forth. Well, here you've got a different frequency, and what I don't know is, in terms of line of sight, what the comparative range might be if you're in a a, a arden or a broadband ham net if you get a 30 mile connection in that microwave region you're you're doing okay when you have a foggy day you're going to have dropout well here you got in the 70 sims band i just don't know what that distance might be now if you're going out over water like say from puerto rico could you hit the states probably not because you got some land other islands uh, that may block it but I think as this develops, they're using uh, time division multiplexing so you can have many communications on the same channel. And they're using off-the-shelf DMR power amps that this little thing will feed a few milliwatts into it. So if you look at it that way, I really encourage the development of it. Dan's comments, notwithstanding in the sense that, no, we shouldn't do it illegally, but if we can develop it experimentally, and show a need for it, even if we throttle it back, it may be a very good mesh technology that could be very useful for public service and MCOM. Yeah, that sounds really interesting, Frank. Well, I know when we first discussed this uh, about an hour ago, uh, Martin said, hey, this would be great fun. Maybe we can, uh, us guys in the UK could set this up. We should be able to communicate uh, uh, locally enough on it and uh, see what's what. But you still up for that, mine? Yeah. But then, of course, we realise that you've actually probably got to spend some money on specific hardware to make it work. So it's it's not just a case of plugging an interface into your radio or you know a simple interface or a USB cable. 
uh, or a signal link device into your radio. You've got to, you've got to have something else to do it. But when I first read this story, I thought, oh, good, something else for the uh, D Star and Fusion haters to complain about. But of course, then you realize it's packet radio. I do wonder, you know, we've got so many digital standards out there now. And I'm not necessarily talking about digital voice, but digital standards in this sense. Why, where do we draw the line? You know, why do we constantly need new stuff? Why is nobody bettering the current stuff we've got? Why is nobody looking to make them compatible? And the reason I say this is when you hear a mode, whatever it is, you can tune through the band, whether you're on you know, uh, VHF, UHF, HF, wherever. Half the time, you know, okay, you can recognize some sounds, but half the time you've got no idea where it is. Different countries, the band plans don't always match between the countries. It's very difficult then to know what software you're loading. Where, where, where do you go with that? But I'm curious by this. I'd like to give it a go. But at the same time, I'd really like them to see, to see them developing along with other modes as well to make them all take the best of the, you know, the best of the D-Star mode, the best of the Hamlet mode, the best of whatever, and then congeal them all together. Well, you know, along those lines, I I think what the deal is here, right, is we're we're just now feeling, how should I say it, feeling the possibilities of all this stuff, right? Mm. So it's going to take some time for that to all shake out. Yeah. In the meantime, you get these people that say, "Hey, I got a better idea. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do this." Yeah. And and at some point, well, and maybe or maybe not, something will get adopted, and that'll become the sort the of standard, the standard. Yeah. You Maybe know? I just want things too, you know, too quickly, too soon. I mean, you know, <laughs> we're in 2019. I'm expecting it now, and yeah, it's just... yeah, yeah. So you know, yeah, I, the 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 quote I love about standards is, you know, the nice thing about standards, there's so many of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and and you know, I mean, but so that's that's just where we're at now. And I think if you look at uh, in other industries, that sort of happens, right? You know, it's, people come up with their versions of things, oh, yeah. and then. You standardize on something. Well, I'm still backing Betamax. I think it's the future. <laughs> well, that Dan's hit on a point that from science, when you sort of, those of us who've studied technology, uh, periods of innovation are very confusing for the reasons that, that Dan talked about. That, you know, the problem with standards, there's so many of them. And yet, you don't get innovation until you have that. So it's a matter of a cycle of, uh, as Martin has said, you know, figure out what's good for production mode, that is, if you're in a contest in ham radio, if you got these experimental modes out there, geez, I mean, who, how many are going to be in that mode? So that's more what I'd call production mode, because that's what we do. We we see contacts. So that's that's just part of I think the innovative uh, uh, cycle. And, and I think the other thing on this, guys, is it's showing that there's our hobbies alive. It's actually Absolutely. moving forward. It's developing. It's it's moving with the times, and people are innovating, which has got to be good for the hobby long term. Yeah, not disagreeing with that. So I kind of like it, and uh, we'll we'll see how it goes. We'll keep an eye on it. Um, I wish it every success, and if it turns out to be a really good mode, hey, we'll keep it like we did. I mean, go back to the nineteen sixties. Uh, everybody pretty much was on AM, and they had this new fangled mode come out called SSB. <laughs> you know, there was a lot of aggravation about that, but let's <laughs> let's wait and see. All right, moving to the next news story, uh, and I had to just start check that this wasn't an April Fool's, but Dan assures me that it isn't. Um, a petition to seek limited digital modes to be open source software. Uh, Dan, did you blog about this one as well? Yes, I did. And the idea here is that some people, they are, the argument I'll put, say, is, is that some people think that these like things like WinTor, WinLink, and that would use PacTor are not really easily decoded and that means that those transmissions are not readily receivable by the general amateur radio population. And that's a violation of certainly the FCC rules and uh, I would guess international rules. So, so that, that's sort of the, the main point here, okay? The, the Windling guys will, will, will 
argue that that's not the case. There's some documents somewhere that people can use and supposedly make make things to um, decode the transmissions. But in reality, the general ham is not able to do that anymore. The other issue here is the is this is aimed at previous petitions for rulemaking, which would allow these automatically controlled digital stations to use up to 2.8 kilohertz of bandwidth. And the thought here is that they're going to get a ton of these stations on the air, and they're going to interfere with all the other lower bandwidth uh, uh, modes in, in that portion of the band, including CW and Teletype and FT8 even. So that, that's the idea behind all this. Now, whether or not that hap- happens in, in practice, I don't know. You never know until you try it. I personally have not ever been interfered by an automatically controlled digital station. So that's the, the issue at hand here. Yeah. I think sometimes we worry about things before they happen as well. Frank, uh, right. being, being an FT, FCC uh, story, do you want to go next on this one? Sure. Uh, I think Dan summarized it well. I, I think the counter argument that this article mentions is that, well, who's complaining? Well, that's like having a very dysfunctional police force and saying, well, we don't have any crimes for this. You know, our official observer program here in the States with ARL is pretty much became dormant to defunct. And that's an opinion, but it's the one I have. So much so that the ARL is now creating a new one. And we've got malicious interference on HF. We've got malicious interference on repeaters. We've caught some of those. The FCC has gone after some of the pirates on commercial bands. And, and the ARL is trying to get a new team that can use technology. One of the things I hope they use uh, are the developments in uh, RF direction finding using multiple SDRs. Uh, Gerald Youngblood, who's president of Flex Radio, and I sat down and outlined the system using SDRs that can be placed in each region in the U.S., it can record the entire ham bandwidth on HF. Uh, if you're naughty, uh, you're 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 like one of these traffic lights at these uh, toll roads, which you where you go through and they take a picture of your license tag. And they just send you a bill. You know, you don't even stop to pay the toll. Well, uh, to some degree, we need to be able to enforce this kind of malicious interference that Dan's talking about through new methods. So, I think that's a uh, a red herring argument, but. Uh, this this is a quagmire, and it does beg the question of getting some clarity on it for everybody. Yeah. So coming over this side of the pond, mine. What's your thoughts about uh, digital software should be open source? Well, I'm I'm thinking that it's, that it's probably a good thing. I don't like all these proprietary things that come out. I I wonder how. This will apply to other modes like digital voice modes, both like motor turbo C4 FM. Could this pave the way longer term for multi digital mode radios? Whoever makes that is onto something. But I mean, if you know, if if, if things could head that way, great. But yeah, I th- I think they should be open source to be honest with you, because then it paves the way for more development, doesn't it? Yeah. People can better. That goes back to what we were previously saying about. Making the uh, if, if if people are going to develop it and they're going to take the best of everything, then yeah, go for it. Yeah, this is a good one, Chris. Uh, give me the last word on this one. Well, I think we should be a little bit careful because I think things like D Star is not an open source standard, so that would mean would that be banned if this rule came in, and potentially others, other proprietary systems that that are quite popular could could end up being banned if. I think the this, the reason why we have a rule around not having encryption is that yeah absolutely so that you know if if someone if, if you hear a signal you know someone somewhere can decode it and it's not a secret encrypted message that only two people are able to to communicate and I think in the in the, I don't, it's, it's difficult one. I can see both sides of the argument here I think however that we're we're we're, we're too far down the line now I think we've already got too many systems out there which have proprietary uh, coding that if we banned it now or if it got banned in a certain part well, that would have a, a you know a, quite a severe impact on people that are actually not really causing any problems 
Yeah, well, maybe uh, maybe the only option out on this one is to uh, move towards open source. Uh, what we've got out there now, say that you can't develop it uh, in any great depth, put extra features on, unless it's open, the features are extra open source. But, hey. Let, let me just make one small correction. The standard for D-Star is open. It's, it was put out by the J Japanese Amateur yeah. Radio League. Yeah. It's the realization of the codec in a chip Correct. that instructs yeah, so, the set that's yeah. proprietary. But, yeah, you start, but your you point's start, taken. So, it, if if, you if there's only one chip, entity it? that can afford to produce that chip, then effectively to the market, it's it's proprietary. But yeah, so yeah, I mean, D Star's got a number of off-the-shelf components. Like you say, it's not a the standard itself isn't, but the the Ambi chip that she's made, you know, owned by DVSI, is a proprietary part of the solution, which I think. I'm not sure exactly what the wording of this motion is, but I think it might is a danger. It might make that um, you know not allowed essentially. All right. Well, as I say, that one will probably run for a while. Our next news story. I said to the boys, "There's a a new uh, awards scheme. It's called the Grid and Prefix Award Program." And I said, "Do we need another uh, award system?" And all four of them shouted at me and went, yes, we always do. So uh, uh, go on, Chris, you can go first on this one. Well, it's funny, we seem to report quite regularly on the podcast about new award schemes. And you know, We talked a while ago in the UK, there was a Work Tall Postcodes um, award, which was being arranged by uh, one of our UK dealers. Uh, and this sounds similar. I mean, we talked about it before that we started to recall, you know, I mean, the reason for awards is, is, is kind of gives us a reason to go out and use our radios. It gives us, it gives us a, you know, a purpose to go and actually use this stuff that we have gone and spent our money on and got a license to use. It gives us a reason to go and do that. It gives us that, that motivation to go and, and, uh, and, and put our, our kit to use. So I think awards are a good thing. Having another one, well, I, mean, I mean, I suppose... Is that a bad thing? Not really. You know, I guess you know the, the, I, I, it comes down to popularity. I mean, what's the reason why you'd want an award? Well, I guess you can maybe print out a certificate and stick it on your wall and brag to your friends. You know, if, if that's what your friends are interested in doing, I suppose. So yeah, you know, I, I, I think awards. You know, for example, SOTA. I think it's a great award, a great award scheme. It gets people out and about. So it's a, bit, a little bit about. Um, enjoying the countryside, enjoying mountains, enjoying getting out and about, as well as using radio. So I, I think awards are a good thing. So another awards, we, I'm, I'm probably not going to do this, but, you know, I can see why it will be, uh, will be interesting for some people. Right. Well, I know that Dan's talked about a Work Tool KB6NU award. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, we, I, what I talked about was Work Tool Washington, which is our county here. Yeah. But... But I, but I, you know, so at first I thought, well, these, you know, maybe these guys are just trying to make some money off it. You know, you could pay them five bucks and you get them a, get a certificate. But, but apparently not. Your, your, your cost is all donation here. So, so they have no uh, monetary interest in the award. And that being the case, like, yeah, that's cool. You know, uh, I don't know. Well, why? It's like, why not? Right. Yeah, yeah. I was just say there's some good good awards schemes out there. That you've got the Work Tool States. There's a Work Tool Britain Award. Um, the Work Tool Postcodes one in the UK has just started up. There's a Work Tool Ireland, and I'm sure, uh, like the SOTA is, is worldwide. Uh, Ireland's on the air. All these award schemes are there, and uh, some people do like to have um, bits of paper on their their wall. Mine. What do you think? I'm thinking I must be due an award because I've worked down on 2.4 gigahertz. Granted, there was an internet connection in between, but that's that's neither here nor there. Um, <laughs> it was here and there, but actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I well, I, I don't go in for awards personally. I'm not that big on them. If don't get me wrong, if someone wanted to give me an award, I'd take it. But I wouldn't fill out the paperwork and apply for one. If it's an incentive for people to get on the air, then yeah, why not? What I am against, though is I'm against people paying for awards and being charged for it. I think if you want to give someone an award, send it off. If you've got to pay for it, well, I kind of see that as well. Just print one out yourself. I don't really see the, the logic of it. I think the rules are quite... I don't think you're actually allowed to receive an award 
certainly in the UK, we, um, you can't profit from amateur radio, so you couldn't you'd be given an award. You'd have to somehow, I mean, yeah, download it and print it out. It's probably the simplest way of getting around that. But I don't think you can, if someone's going to print out for you and send you something through the post, then I think you have to pay for it. I think that's kind of part of the deal with your license. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I'm, not, that, I'm not big on paying things like that. Is, we is like that really- stuff. Is that really true about the English rules? Because here in the U.S., that's there's there's no rule about that. The I, only I thing think you can't make a money off of is operating a, an amateur radio station, okay. but it, you can make money from any other aspect of amateur radio. Yeah. I'm sure I I'm sure I read that somewhere, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I would, check that. I would check that. I would check that out. In fact, I would be interested in knowing that. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's a truthful answer. Frank, what's your uh, thoughts on this one well you know hunters uh, mount their uh prized uh, kills on their wall fishermen get them put on the wall there's even a a fake one you can buy at walmart here in the states that'll sing a song you know and uh I, there was something you know the who's who uh volumes were out once upon a time after i got my phd and became a college professor uh, my mother didn't know what I did. She just knew, you know, I was one of those college professors. And so there was this award called Who's Who in the World? And it was in this big book. And as a joke, I don't know how much I paid for it, but I filled out the form. I sent it in. And I got this nice leather-bound, four-inch-thick book, Who's Who in the World? And, and it was a little bit of a joke for me. Well, I sent it to my mother. Next time I went home, it was on the coffee table. And she was darn proud of the fact that her son was in who's who in the world because he was somebody. So I guess it depends on how you take these things. You, you can kind of take them as a joke. Others might be impressed, such as your dear mom. Uh, and so unlike animals and fish, though, getting one of these awards doesn't take anything off the face of the earth. You didn't kill anything. Uh, so I'm okay with it. I am the only ham in EM42XK, the extended prefix. So I'm open for business. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but see, that would be a real violation if you if you accepted money for somebody working you and giving then you providing a QSL card. That would be a violation. Of the yeah. Now business in the form of working, but not business in the form of getting. Hey, just like we want to put that CEO of ARL to work by working Howard Mickle. Now, I'm open for business to work me, not to get paid. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. You're not going to sure take some, money for your I'm sure if somebody wanted to send you some money, Frank, you just take it anyway if they just wanted to pop it in the post, yeah? Well, well we do that with QSL cards internationally. Don't we put okay. cash in, in there? So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, anyway, guys, a nice idea. Something else to uh, be happening, and as I said to the boys before we started recording this, I think if you've got a purpose to go out and do something or a purpose on radio, it will happen. If you just say, on Saturday I'm going to operate for two hours, when Saturday comes around, there'll be a low chance you'll actually do it. If you uh, decide that you're going to chase an award, or you go out with a group or a special event station, that's when things happen. So uh, I think it's a good thing. And, uh, yeah, as I say, I did ask, do we need another awards scheme? And uh, I think everybody almost took me apart on it. (laughs) (laughs) But there you go. Last news story, we'll cover this one fairly quickly. The uh, 2019 State of the Hobby results are out. Uh, Chris, you put this one in, so do you want to go first on this one? Yeah, I can do, yeah. So the, the, I'll just bring it up again, actually, soon, so we just close it down. Yeah, there are some interesting, I mean, it's a bit of fun, really. Um, it's not scientific. It's those folks that have actually responded to, to, the, um, to, 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 the, to the survey, so it's never going to be 100% accurate. But uh, there are some interesting things. You know, the thing about, the, for example, it talks about what is your age, and uh, there were 35% of people responding with, that are over 65 and another 30% that are between 55 and, and um, 64. So altogether, it's about two-thirds of the respondents were over 60, over 50, 55. So it might give you an idea around the age. But again, it might just be that those folks are mainly retired and therefore have got time to fill in surveys, you know. So that's not necessarily indicative of, of, of reality. But uh, yeah, there's, there's interesting things on here. Unless you do, the guys might have some some ideas around or some thoughts on some of the other 
uh, questions. There's quite a lot of questions people have been asked and what their interests are and you know how, how many contacts you make a day and this sort of thing. So um, guys, what, what, what do the thoughts think about some of the results of some of the questions here? Well, I think over being over 65, don't mean to say you've got a lot of time if you podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, stop it, mine. Go on, Mr. Ruffer, what are you up to? I was just having a uh, a, a quick read through it at the moment. I mean, there's, there's, by comparison, there's not as many, um, I don't know how many people have actually filled the survey out, but it's not a, a massively indicative thing, but I'm interested to see. How did you get interest, interested in radio? My father was in CB. Played with CB as a kid. Um, and you know, there's a few things like that. Podcasts, I wonder if we're in there somewhere. People uh, got interested, but... Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting reading, that's for sure. Yeah, all these things are, are well worth a look. Um, I'm going to bring Frank in at the end. Uh, Dan, your thoughts on this one? Well, I, so I know the guy who's, who's done this, and, uh, you know, I think it's a it's certainly an interesting thing to, to read through. Um, you know, maybe, like, like Frank says, it's it's not maybe as scientific as it could be, but still, it's it's got some good information in it. Yeah, and the guy got off his button, got out there and did something, which is right. important. Yeah, he didn't sit around, he had an idea, he got out there. I would never knock somebody for going out there and doing it. Frank, what's your thoughts on it? Well, I, I agree with most of, of what's been said. That, just for listeners, my background is a professional survey researcher. Uh, you know, I've actually done research on doing surveys, uh, th- things like that. And I applaud what this ham is doing. Uh, he seems like a, you know, very congenial ham. Uh, looking at his writing and, and this kind of thing, he obviously puts a lot of work into it. It's a very nice, flashy web-based uh, report, so it's not boring to look at. Uh, as Dan said, uh, you know, it it's not just like the quick facts on the ARL website is. It's a cattle call. And you opt in. The problem with those surveys is if we take them to be representative of all hams, you, you don't know what you've got. Back uh, long years ago, there was a survey put into Literary Digest magazine, which was kind of a very popular magazine in, in the U.S., and it said somebody was going to win, and I think Harry Truman became our president. I mean, and, and it was like completely opposite. Well, what the problem with that is that the readers of that magazine were not representative of all voters. And just like this one, if people opt in, and I've done some of these for the league, and, and they're fun to read. They stimulate your thinking, just like some of the things that Martin Rothwell uh, pointed out. And so they're fun. I'm glad that they're, they're doing it because we don't have another source of information that is scientifically grounded. American Radio Relay League has in its uh, mission to do things like this, to learn about amateur radio. And yet when they do surveys, as the interview with Howard Mickle indicated, they don't want to release those to all hams or other hams for further analysis. Now, maybe they will continue to analyze those data. But in my humble opinion, the league, I don't know about RSGB or other societies, but the American Radio Relay League needs to have at least a biannual survey that has scientific integrity to learn about hams and amateur radio clubs, commercial entities, because we need to know about amateur radio to deal with a lot of the issues that we talk about every two weeks on this podcast. So I'll kind of end with that, but I applaud what the guy's doing, and I say bravo to him, and, and I hope he keeps it up. It's just a shame that we don't have other sources that do give us clearly rep- more representative data, but I, I say great, on, good on him. I'm glad he's doing it. Yeah, same here. But to you, Frank, if if you give people data that they don't understand, let, let's say you, I mean, let, let's say you gave me some data and I look at it and I misinterpret it, and uh, it's the glass half full, the glass half empty scenario. I might be saying, oh, God, doom and gloom, it's the end of the world, and all these sort of things, because I've misinterpreted the data. So giving people the data is possibly not the whole story. I would suggest that they need guidance on what that data means. Would you not agree? 
Well, here's how I would parse that. I mean, you make a good point, but here's how I would respond to it. But you give it to everybody, including those like me and others who know how to analyze survey data. They can publish rubbish and then be shown the folly of their ways by people who do know how to analyze those data. Point I'm getting at is, it's very standard in publicly funded research today in the United States, at least, that your data have to become public. Why? So other people can validate your results and also look at them in competitive or comparative ways. Yeah. So that's how we respond to that, Martin. Sure, you may get to uninitiated and make a mess of it all. Would you handle? Would you hand a QRO amplifier to someone who doesn't really know how to turn it on? But, well, yeah, I mean, yeah. There's a danger there too. Go ahead. No, I was going to say I agree with you what you're saying, but equally, it, it, the internet is often about who shouts the loudest. I. Mean, how many times has a newspaper printed something and then had to print a retraction? So the newspaper prints the headline on, on, on the front page and the retraction's always on like page 92 or whatever it is at the bottom paragraph. So if somebody gets this stuff wrong and analyzes it wrong and is a big enough celebrity, whatever you want to call them, or they've got sufficient uh, way with the social media and such, it would be very hard because people won't won't remember the retraction. They'll only remember what what the first person said. Well, you you have a great argument, and so then then what are we to do? Just let the ARL analyze the data, and they're the only voice. No, I think we have a my ARL group that has begged to differ. So in in the sense of openness, paid for by league funds, shouldn't at least be open to those who certainly have some credentials? I mean, the, the bottom line is, uh, uh, Martin, one reaction to your point is, do you, don't, do you not let anybody have access to the data except the league because somebody might not interpret it correctly? I, th- I, think, I think the only sensible option is that the league... Uh, for arguments, so we're talking about the league's database. If the league were to publish that, that that information with guidelines, but also take professionals like yourself and offer you the data, I don't think it should go out to every ham for argument's sake. Because unless you've, you're trained in that, I mean, we're ham radio operators. We're not trained in statistical work like 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 you are, Frank. So, and it's a skill that I don't have. Sure. So but, I'm. But I'm you right know, he, here's the thing, Martin. There are others like me, and uh, you know, I'm I'm not the only one. I'm just vocal, and I'm in a microphone, and I happen to uh, have the pleasure of being a presenter on, on uh, the, this podcast. So there are others, and and that's kind of a criticism that I've made before about the ARL. There's lots of talent in the 750,000 licensees. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only one member. Yeah. So, but your point's well taken. Yeah. And, and Dan, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm pulling Dan in the argument here. Hang on, sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I do argue about this a lot. Yeah. But. <laughs> yeah. So, sorry, Frank. I, I do, I, I always enjoy our discussions. Yeah. Um, I enjoy our discussions, and we're going a bit long on this, but I do enjoy our discussions because uh, you have, you're a much higher educated level than myself, and I admit that, but we always manage to have some really good discussions, and, and we don't always agree, but we I, we respect each other, I believe, and, and that's, that's a good thing. You, absolutely. That's a good thing. So I think we'll you leave bet. it there, Frank. <laughs> uh, you bet. Yeah, so uh, that was a good one. And uh, for those of you who thought Frank and I were going to fall in, having a fall out, I'm afraid you're <laughs> so, so sorry going to miss that one up. <laughs> oh, dear. So I, I, I spent a career being challenged, uh, Martin, and, and frankly enjoy it. I don't see it as, you know, arguing in, in, in the getting mad sense. No, no. It's merely airing out different sides of something. And, and I think, uh, that, that, but because clearly, uh, clearly the league looks at it like not letting other people have access to it. And maybe that's a, that's a, the most valid point, 
Yeah. I sort of believe more in openness yeah. uh, in terms of that. But your point's well taken, uh, very well taken. Yeah, and and the thing is, by discussing it, we both learn. So that's that's the good thing. Anyway, moving on to uh, our next bit, which is that's the end of the news stories. So uh, I'm now going to find out what the boys have been up to amateur radio-wise since the last time they were here. Let's go around the table in the order I've got. Chris, what have you been up to? Well, you and I have both been training, so I won't steal your thunder. I'll let you pick that one up at the end. Um, but we have done a, a foundation course. Also, recently, at the scout hall that we use for the radio club that we attend, we spent some time, um, well, I spent some time with the rest of the car club credit for this, uh, but amongst a bunch of other guys at the club, we put up uh, a new HF aerial. So we had a problem for a while at the club because uh, a little while ago the trees were trimmed, so should I say drastically cut back, and we lost our uh, HF aerials. So we finally got around to putting up a um, a dipole for, um, I think it works 20 and 40 metres. I don't think it quite is long enough for 80 metres, but um, hey, we've got something on the air now on HF, so... Uh, we, w- we spent some time on Sunday doing that, and that's good. We've now on back on the air, so um quite pleased about that one. So um those are the main things I've been doing in radio for the last uh, last few weeks. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've been fairly busy. I know that. We, um, mine. You're always busy at work, but uh, have you had a chance to play amateur radio? Not so much. I generally use network radio, Zello, most mornings on my way into work. So I uh, have a listen around some of the channels on there, occasionally pop in and have a chat with people on the way in, uh, which I'm quite enjoying. Just uh, have a search for the network radio um, or just add my calls. And if you want to uh, give me a shout, by all means, happy to do that. A uh, little bit of Fusion, a little bit of D-Star, just playing with that. Otherwise, slightly radio related. Been playing with some uh, new radio microphones at work uh, that operate in the 6 and 800 megahertz band and just trying to work out how many microphones uh, we can fit into our allotted bandwidth um, and still make them work without them interfering with each other, uh, which has been a bit of fun. And it's very difficult to try and explain that to non-radio people as to why you can't put it you know, just a couple of kilohertz away. You're like, well, why can't you put 30 of them in this space? Not just the <laughs> bandwidth. And, oh, it's too difficult to explain. But um, fortunately, they've accepted that I understand radio and just leave me to it. And if I say you can't get more than 10 there, then they just take that for my, they just take that for granted. But um, yeah, that's a bit it about it. So work's been crazy busy. So not uh, not had as much of a chance to play with my toys recently. No, no. I, th- I guess you've been busy because uh, we haven't seen much of you recently. Dan, yourself, yeah, you didn't make it last episode, so it's nearly like four weeks since we've seen yourself. Maybe yeah, longer. Yeah. yeah. So I'm always busy with ham radio stuff. As uh, my latest, however is uh, I just bought this thing called the Morserino. And it's uh, sort of a combination CW training aid slash touch gear slash, it, and it's actually got a little uh, uh, ISM transmitter in it. So if you had multiple Morserinos, you could transmit CW between them. Wow. So it's kind of a cool little project. And uh, I got I just got it like a couple of days ago, and I haven't got it all built yet. Uh, but uh, it looks like kind of it'll be a fun project. Sounds it. And one other thing you, you're you too humble to mention, but you will be at Dayton. You will be teaching a tech uh, one-day tech class, and you've been let down because, you know, you're a superstar and people haven't signed up for your course yet. So, well, uh, I don't know about that, but, but yes, let's just, let's just, I'll just say there's still uh, room in the class. <laughs> yeah. If anybody wants to sign up for it, yeah, go and see Dan. And if you're really unlucky, you might see some of us with Dan at odd times <laughs> of the day. <laughs> I don't know whether that's going to be a help or a hindrance, Dan, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for that. Cheers. Frank, what have you been up to? Oh, I've been continuing to promote uh, APRS Digipeters. We've had a couple go offline, a little ARL. Uh, wearing of the hat there got got another site that's up and and trying to get some more of that going building out a website finished a feature interview that'll appear in a future episode of icq podcast with a lifelong blind ham 
who has been 50 years uh, in amateur radio, and he's a professional broadcaster. I think you'll enjoy hearing about this person when that, that feature drops. So I uh, was happy to do that. So some more of that kind of stuff. Plus, it's spring here in the, the south, and that means that a lot of yard work to do. So I've been doing some of non-ham activity. Yeah, I've got some of that to do, Frank, uh, early part of next week. This week's a manic week for me, but uh, I know what what it's like with the yard work to do. Okay, well, I have done very uh, very much uh, what Chris said. Um, not a lot, uh, mainly VHF um, operating and uh, a little bit of fusion, but... Uh, Mainly tied up. Uh, Chris and I were tied up for two weekends on a on a training course. Uh, very disappointed that um, we had only a couple of students sign up, but uh, a couple or two is still worth doing. If somebody really wants to be in our hobby, it's worth putting the effort in. Unfortunately, one of the guys um, told us or sent us an email at half past eleven at night on the day before the course started, that he wasn't coming. So uh, we had one student who had two-to-one tuition, and I'm I'm rather glad to say, after all that effort, he did actually pass, didn't he, Chris? He did, thankfully, yeah. yeah. Well done to uh, to Len for uh, getting his new foundation course sign, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So if you're in the London area... If you're maybe on the GB3XP and you hear M7LEN, which is Len, um, give him a shout. Tell him you know us and uh, I'm sure he'll be quite pleased to chat to you. So that's what we've been up to. And uh, I think, guys, we've all been pretty busy. So uh, that's a nice one. Well, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us tonight on the podcast. I'd like... Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Chris Howard. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Been fun as usual. Yeah, great. Uh, Mr. Martin Rothwell. Always good fun. Mr. Dan Romacek. Glad to be back. Yeah, we're glad to hear. And Mr. Frank Howell. Enjoyed it greatly, guys. Yeah, yeah. So uh, thanks, guys. And when I say 73 to the guys, this is not the end of the podcast. This is just the end of this section. So, uh, 73s, guys. Thanks for your help tonight. 73. 73. 73. Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now. For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. And now it's time to have a look at the news in brief with me, Colin M6BOY. Just uh, a month to go now until Hamvention and uh, the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting, which is just a short drive away from uh, the Hamvention uh, location, uh, will be open over the weekend of Hamvention from Thursday the 16th to Sunday the 19th. Covering uh, 50 years, um, six of the most powerful shortwave transmitters in the world broadcast uh, listening uh, from Europe, Africa, South America, from the Bethany Station. Uh, millions each week heard uh, 50 languages beamed, beamed uh, in Tashi from the hilltops. And uh, they'll be opening the museum, um, including as well its ham shack, uh, Whiskey Charlie 8 Victor Oscar Alpha, uh, will be open as well, along with some genuine exhibits as well, uh, a comprehensive collection of the Drake amateur radio gear, uh, the remaining Collins uh, 250,000 watt transmitter, uh, along with many other things included there. Admission is just for a donation of uh, $5 uh, US. Uh, and I say there are various uh, opening times, but pop these on the ICQ podcast website for you, so you've got all the information there. Um, they're also offering as well a special um, new museum donor rate as well, with some uh, added benefits as well there for you as well. There, uh, there's also potentially a tour which is going to be conducted by uh, internationally known broadcast veterans uh, Jay Adrick and uh, also uh, Jeff uh, Middenhall, uh, both amateurs. Uh, Jay's uh, K6 uh, Charlie uh, Juliet Yankee and uh, Jeff Whiskey 8 Golf November Mike. Um, transport from the museum um, to the uh, WLW transmitter site and back uh, is included. 
uh, space is limited, uh, so uh, you're suggested to book in advance. So again, we'll put all the links information for this on the ICQ podcast uh, website for you, and you can check that out for you if you're travelling to Hamvention uh, this year. Very interesting uh, article came in now from uh, listener uh, Lucy Helton, uh, Kilo Delta 2, Mike Foxtrot Victor. Uh, Lucy is going to be the artist in residence at uh, SIM in Reykjavik in Iceland. And uh, she's partnering with a local ham. Um, I think it's John P. Jonsson, uh, Tango Foxtrot 3, Julia Alpha. Uh, he's a local um, member of the Icelandic Radio Amateurs Association. They're going to be transmitting uh, slow scan TV and uh, making this into a art installation uh, in, say, in, in a sort of a rare um, collection uh, of uh, slow scan TV of the Icelandic uh, glaciers that they've uh, been uh, working with and making from there. So the uh, transmission will consist of um, uh, 12 uh, uh, images and they will be transmitting on five different glacier images over 15 days. Uh, the band they're going to be using is 20 meters uh, upper side band, uh, 14.230 uh, megahertz, and they're going to be transmitting at 1, 6 and 11 um, p.m. GMT time. So uh, very interesting uh, there of uh, amateur radio and art coming together. And uh, we'll pop a, a link uh, to Lucy's uh, website on our podcast page so you can check out more information of uh, what the guys are doing. Uh, that event, just to let you know, runs through to the 23rd of April. Alan Henley uh, also got in contact with us. He's from the Chippenham Ham Radio Club in the UK. Uh, and he's call sign 2E1 Golf Quebec X-Ray Alpha. Um, he gets in contact as well and says that uh, following on for their 52nd annual general meeting. Congratulations, uh, I say, on oh, such a long established club there. Um, they've uh, they've been working upon uh, realigning their amateur radio training course with their uh, dedicated team for the new RSGB syllabus. Um, now they are uh, continuing to run a fully subsidized foundation level course for people interested in getting started in amateur radio um, and are currently looking at filling up their next uh, um, course which will be taking place on the weekend of the 20th to 21st of July. course uh, includes 10 hours of learning and practical uh, exams uh, followed by obviously the RSGB's multiple choice uh, exam uh, which will take place in a training centre in Kington Langley. Um, so as I say, they're one of the largest clubs in their local area, over 70 members, uh, ranging from teenagers to pensioners, all with a common interest in, in radio. Uh, the club is recognised for its training and development of newly existing members and currently holds a 100% pass rate for members taking the nationally recognised exams. So congratulations to the guys there. Um, so as I say, if you'd like to get in touch with the club, we'll put links as well onto the uh, ICQ podcast page of how to get in touch. So if you're in the area and you're, you're looking to join a new club or a growing club or you're interested, you're a shortwave uh, listener and interested in getting involved, uh, feel free to get involved with the guys there. Well, now we head up to our feature this episode, which is a feature on the S-meter. As always, guys, I hope you enjoy. And now what you've all been waiting for. This episode's feature from the ICQ podcast. Hi guys, for this episode's feature I wanted to talk about S-meters. This feature came about because I was asked about uh, RST reports and you know as well as I do they're not always accurate the uh, RST reports. Now the R stands for readability the S is signal, and the T is tone if you're doing Morse. How many times have you heard 5 and 9, what did you say in a contest? I understand that uh, operators use 5 and 9 because they're software set up, and they're particularly interested in just getting the call sign or the information quickly. But all of jesting aside, if you're a new ham into the hobby, you kind of want to know a bit more about it. And readability is quite, quite obvious, really, because uh, you either can hear them or you can't. Whereas, and let, let's be brutally honest here, um, the tone in modern, modern day transceivers is going to be a nine, an absolute perfectly uh, sinusoidal tone. Uh, very, very few radios these days put out uh, a bad tone for more transmissions. However, if you're building your own 
and to or have a very old piece of QRP gear, the tone might not be perfect. But the one in the middle, the signal strength was the one that uh, I was being asked. Well, how can I prove it? How do, how do I know this? How do I know that? Was some of the questions. So my argument was, well, okay, well, I'm going to read them from the, the list here. But it says a, uh, a signal strength of one is uh, a faint signal, barely perceptible. Signal level of two is a very weak signals. S3 is weak signals. S4 is fair signals. S5 is fairly good signals. S6 is good signals. And I emphasize that S6 is good signals. S7 is moderately strong signal. S8 is a strong signal. And S9 is extremely strong signals. So that's the definition of what each of the S points is supposed to mean within amateur radio. Now, I looked in it a bit deeper and I wanted to be exactly right when I gave my answer back to a few of my colleagues. And when I looked it up, an S point on your, your meter, your radio, if it's calibrated correctly, is a 6 dB. So for every S point you raise, it's a change of 6 dB in signal strength, which corresponds to effectively a doubling of uh, voltage and four times the power at the receiver input, so on the arrow inputs. Now, all that, what does that actually mean? Well, it means that if the meter's calibrated, you can work out how much signal you've got at your antenna and how it's working. Now, one thing I suddenly came across, and I wasn't aware until I started doing this, is there's different S-point uh, calibration for different bands of frequencies. So for argument's sake, HF and S9 is 50 microvolts, whereas on uh, VHF and above, S9 is 5 microvolts, a lot, lot less than microvolts. So when you've got uh, your S meter, it obviously has to be calibrated. I assume it's done at the factory on a new rig. And at some point in time, you may wish to uh, have your S meter double calibrated. Now, the way you do this is you uh, feed a signal generator with a 50 ohm impedance output into your uh, radio. Radio, You uh, set the frequencies the same on the signal generator and the receiver front end. And you transmit uh, for HF rigs a signal of 50 microvolts uh, into the receiver. And your meter should read S9. If it doesn't, there should be a pot to just adjust it onto S9. Similarly, for VHF, UHF transceivers, once again, you do exactly the same, but you're looking to inject a signal of uh, 5 microvolts. Now, interestingly enough, and I've not been able to prove this, is if signals below 30 megahertz require 50 microvolts and signals above 30 megs require 5 microvolts for an S9 signal. Most HF rigs have uh, HF and 6 meters. I don't know the answer to this one, but is, um, is the 6 meter S meter uh, not calibrated effectively properly? Or do they have two pots? You'd have to look at the circuit to see if there's an adjustment for both 6 meters and, uh, and HF. Now, when we talked about uh, this is how to set them up, since the S meter is derived from the receiver, it's so AGC line, it is very relatively linear from about S3 or S4 upwards. And a good AGC would normally kick in around about 100 to 105 uh, dBm. Now, below S3 or S4, the, the AGC is not uh, working on your radio, so you may not have a very accurate measurement below about S3 or S4. So just bear that one in mind. And as I said earlier, the statement that S meters are totally worthless or a change of two S points means nothing, okay, as I've heard from some amateurs, is absolutely rubbish. You know, for every S point you go up, 
you're going up 6 dB, which is a quadrupling of your signal power. So really, you have to realize that, uh, you know, the S points do actually mean something if you mu is calibrated, if your meter is calibrated correctly. Another thing is, for using an S meter, is that an S meter gives you a relative indication of what's going on. So for argument's sake, if you're on a 40 meter band and your S meter is showing so S4 of noise, uh, that's around about 103 uh, dBm. Your receiver might actually have a minimum detectable signal value of say 133 dBm, which means that you're actually losing 30 dB of dynamic range on your receiver purely because of the amount of noise at your location. So you can kind of work out those sort of things. You can use an S meter to gauge two different aerials. If you if you have a uh, two aerials via a switch box for argument's sake and you want to see which one's got the most gain on receive, what you can do is tune to a station and switch between the two antennas. Uh, or you could talk to another amateur and at the same time, when he's uh, communicating with you, switch between the two antennas to see which one gives you the highest S point reading. And uh, that way you would be able to determine that which one's the best. Now the QRP issue. You know, let, let's be brutally honest about this. I am a QRP operator. I get very annoyed when operators don't hear me. I understand why they don't want to hear me, because they don't want to hear the noise, or they don't want to hear, uh, they're only interested in the strong stations. So they set their RF gain up so that uh, they can only hear signals of S9 and above. Now, that's, uh, that's great for them, but they're losing out on so much. Because if uh, a station, if I'm running 100 watts to somebody, and uh, they give me an S8 signal strength. If I drop my power to 25 watts, which is a quarter of the 100 watts, I should be getting a signal report of S7. And as we said earlier, S7 is a moderately strong signal. So I've gone from a strong signal to a moderately strong signal. Uh, so why they can't hear me at S7, I don't know. Um, if I drop uh, another S point and I uh, cut my signal down to say 6 watts which is the new power for the 818 FT818 I have now should be at S6 uh, therefore you know by the time you've got down to the low power we should be being heard even with um, on QRP it's one of those misdemeanors that I think that people set their, their RF gains that they just can't hear you. Now, a lot of this information I got uh, from a GQRP leaflet, because uh, I'm a member of the GQRP club, and it was written by NA5N, uh, the gentleman that produced a, a fact sheet. Uh, but it's very interesting to see how the different uh, signal strengths uh, in the charts uh, appear, and they do mean something. One caveat I did find, though, on another website was that older receivers had their S meters calibrated for S9 at 100 microvolts instead of 50. So just be aware, uh, if you've got a very, very old radio, you may find that your radio is calibrated at 100 microvolts for S9 and not 50. Now, hopefully this has been of interest and uh, clarified some of the bits and pieces that uh, I was looking up for the students. The ICQ Podcast. Getting it said for amateur radio. Well, Dad, uh, thanks uh, for your feature on the uh, the S meter, and as always, uh, hopefully, there's something there for all uh, our uh, listeners and hobbyists out there, from uh, young, old, new, advanced, and uh, and uh, I say, and beginners to uh, hopefully get something out of that feature. Thanks a lot for uh, for doing that for us. 
Well, a bit of feedback, and uh, some of you might know, or well, hopefully all of you know, but hopefully some of you know that we've uh, been publishing on YouTube now for a while, uh, various bits and pieces, and uh, we put uh, a video out on one of the recent features we did on the UHF VHF Weekender transceiver kit. Got a piece of interesting um, feedback here from Alan Ralph. Alan came back to and said him and his wife um, have been building uh, kits for a while, particularly this kit, and uh, I say certainly enjoy it. And he said, why it doesn't necessarily save money and never compete with ready-made uh, equipment from China. Uh, his, his wife have built many kits from the likes of Maplin, Ram Ramsey and Quasar. And uh, she, uh, his wife uh, would have no intention of buying a handheld or linear amplifier, but had a lot of pleasure building the Weekender kit and linear amp. Plus, there was far more uh, interest when she showed the kit at a local radio club. Um, he contacted uh, Jura about a missing uh, part um, and the difference between the PCB and the circuit diagram, but everything was handled quickly and parts sent free of charge. And he's worked in the electrical industry for the past 40 years and did have um, to help with stripping cables, etc. But the majority was his wife's own work when building the kit, and yes, it did work first time. Um, so in essence, I think what he's saying is his experience in essence on, on the kit it differs with, from um, what you found with your kit. And I suppose what Alan and his wife are pretty much saying, Alan's cool sign is a G8 uh, X-ray at Lima Hotel and his wife's uh, M5 ATR, um, is obviously, I really think what he's really coming through with the essence of his feedback is, is obviously the joy of kit building. And um, obviously, you know, you don't build kits for, for saving money. And I think, I'm sure you'd uh, agree with the, the essence of that, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think I think years ago you would have built kits to save money. Today it's uh, for a bit of fun. And uh, like Alan, I've got a similar background. I've been around electronics um, probably almost as long as Alan, if not a little bit longer. But it doesn't matter. That's well, We're not sort of gauging uh, on that one. Um, I think... I think the problem is you can only build the kit you got in front of you. And the one I got, I didn't get directly and it arrived. Now, mine could have been a very early one or it could have been a later one uh, or a different batch. So some of the things that I was speaking about may have changed in some of the kits. I can only review the kit I got. Um, yeah, it didn't work. We are fixed it. Um, Alan's wife managed to get us working first time. Great, you know. I, I openly admitted that it could have been me that blew the module up. I don't think it was, but I think it could have been. Um, but I think what, what I was trying to do is a, is a fair comparison uh, right the way through. And yeah, you're dead right, Alan. It is about the fun of building this stuff. Um, I was saying to Colin a few minutes ago that probably 50% of all the kits I've made have had either problems or parts missing. Um, and like you said, you, you had a part missing in your kit. And I think uh, small kit manufacturers, you know, often the family are helping them put the kits together, um, stuffing components into bags, and they don't necessarily... Um, know what the what the part is. You know, it's just a member of the family helping this, the kit ma manufacturer. But without these people doing that, there wouldn't be half as many kits available. So let's be fair about it. We shouldn't knock them too hard. But I just wanted to be fair and open uh, on what on that uh, little radio. Yeah, and yeah, I will play with it a bit more. But um, that was uh, my experience, yeah. and. Uh, you know, I, I still stand by my um, my my things that the uh, documentation could have been a little bit better. In fairness, Colin. Yeah, I, I suppose it's always it, it's it's a weird thing, isn't it? Kits in our hobby is is that I suppose you can't compare them to say to like a commercially produced jigsaw puzzle or something along those lines. That there are all these elements to it, but I suppose the other thing as well, you got this catch too. I suppose you got those that that would probably find the challenge if you like in in working around maybe a kit that's not maybe 100 percent and really enjoy that challenge but then you've got the other part of you that says but if you buy a product it should be right out of the box and i suppose depending upon i suppose the degree of that and the challenge on it etc or the person's mindset i suppose depends upon the value then that that, that might generate to that, that individual doesn't it 
He <laughs> certainly does. And, and, and for argument's sake, yeah, we all love kits to, to work first time out of the box. Many do. I'll give you that. Many do. But um, the problem comes is if if you if you suddenly have one that doesn't work or doesn't work as it, uh, it ought to, then you've got to have the experience or the ability to fix it. I think one of the other things, that, and it's not just this kit, I'm talking across the board now, I think one of the other things is that kind of you never know quite, when you build something, uh, it works well, but you never know whether you've actually achieved optimum performance. Let's leave it as optimum performance. You know, you can have something that works very well, but is it optimized? And so I always, at the end of the day, at the back of my mind, is it optimized to performance? And the only way you can probably do that is if a group of you build uh, the same device, because then you've got a yardstick. You can say, well, these two are working really well. That one's not working quite so well. And you can bring them up. But uh, it's a good thing, Colin. And, you know, I'll, I think uh, all in all, I think we were basically in agreements on this, even though uh, I'd had some problems and they hadn't. No problems, no problems. Well, you can check out that uh, that video by going to youtube.com forward slash ICQ podcast and also see the other videos that we have there as well. Uh, subscribe as well to the YouTube channel there to get the latest updates as we can get videos on that channel. And uh, I'd say we'd love to hear uh, your thoughts there as well. Other things you can do in the meantime as well, if you haven't done so already, sign up to the uh, newsletter to keep yourself up to date with the latest news stories. Uh, just visit icqpodcast.com, click on the new e-newsletter link, and uh, you can say subscribe to the uh, the newsletter there. We'd like to thank uh, Chris, Mike Zero, Tango Charlie Hotel, Martin, Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lima, uh, Dan, Kilo Bravo 6, November Uniform, and uh, Frank, Kilo 4, Foxtrot Mike Hotel, who um, I understand you had a bit of a, uh, uh, a discussion with during the news around table, Dad. Uh, yeah, Frank, <laughs> I did, I did want to do this. Um, Frank and I get on really, really, really well. Uh, Frank will often talk to me for hours, and I'm really happy with that. Um, Frank and I got a little bit heated. We had an interesting discussion on the podcast. And at the end of it, Frank was, I feel really bad because people might have thought we were going to have a ruck. And uh, so, fact, fact, you've got this from the horse's mouth. Frank and I are not upset with each other. We often have long discussions where one will take one side and one will take the other. And I think Frank enjoys debating as much as I do. So please don't think Frank and I were falling out or about to um, go to fisticuffs because, in fairness, uh, we we have long chats about things and... uh, you just heard one of them, and uh, we agree sometimes to disagree, um, which is fine. Uh, but we all both both learn from each other, which is the good thing, Colin. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. So, so no, Frank. That's like my say. Just check with guys. They're they're still in love with each other, and they'll probably buy each other a coffee in a few weeks' time at, uh, at Dayton uh, Hamvention there. Uh, well, also importantly, well, the last people we've got to thank here is our sponsors, uh, donors this episode, uh, William Heckelman, uh, Kilo Charlie 3 Hotel Zulu Uniform, and Kevin Rump, uh, Whiskey November 7 Zulu. Uh, many thanks for your donations to the ICQ Amateur Radio Podcast. You've kept the show advert free, and uh, we'd like to consider us by visiting www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate, where, as I say, anything you send our way to keep us advert free, keep those... Uh, uh, mattresses and herbal peels and whatever away from the show is greatly, greatly appreciated. Well, you know what, Dad? I think now we get to the time of the show. You know, today at, in the office, they took bought out a big box of chocolate biscuits in the office. And you know what I thought? Mrs. B would love one of these with a cup of tea. So if you haven't got one of these boxes out, when I come over this weekend, I'll bring over some of those biscuits with me so Mrs. B's got one for next time you need to make a cup of tea. What do you reckon? I think your mum might really enjoy that, Colin. I'm sure about that. But your mum's uh, not at work at the moment. Your mum's uh, home with me. So uh, I'm going to rush out to the kitchen right at this moment in time. Uh, but uh, I'm sure your mum would like a chocky bicky if you bring them over. So uh, 
There you go, Colin. No problems at all. Well, look, guys, we're going to wrap this show up. And uh, as always, we'll do this all again in a fortnight's time. Look after you guys, all 73s. 73.